Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I, first of all, I want to thank the committee for in, inviting me. Um, I've never been to um, Florence before or even Tuscany, and, and I have fallen in love with this city. So um, it was difficult for me to come to uh, do my own presentation. I had just gone and seen the uh, David and was uh, so moved that I'd lost track of time. But I'm here now. The other thing I want to say is um, uh, I recommend not uh, presenting after Professor Calabrese at a hormesis conference. Um, he pretty much uh, covers the entire gamut, as he should. And as you'll see in my slides, I am referencing many, much of his work. So uh, I think I would uh, recommend that you look at, at uh, my lecture today as an, an academic one in which it will be an opportunity to sort of underscore what uh, Professor Calabrese has said. Um, so I'm going to talk about some possible clinical uh, applications for hormesis, um, but I want to begin first with uh, a discussion of, of why it has taken us so long to really to come to this point. And let's see if I know how to work this. Good. So um, as Professor Calabrese said, um, hormesis is essentially a, uh, a low-dose stimulation um, and a high-dose inhibition, although there's some notable exceptions to that. Uh, and so one classic example is um, with uh, digitalis um, and cardiac arrhythmia. And it, it, as you all, I, I'm sure, appreciate, uh, that's uh, digitalis is used to control cardiac arrhythmia um, in, in, uh, 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 in low doses. But in, in fact, in high doses, you will uh, induce uh, the arrhythmia. And so this is one of those ones that is an example of hormesis that uh, was called, has been called in the literature, biphasic response. But there is real no difference, really no difference between um, a biphasic response and uh, hormesis, in the, in the, at least in this context. So that being the case, and since this observation has been made for decades, uh, close to a century, in fact, um, why have there been no real discussions uh, about its clinical applications. And I'll steal some of my own thunder. One of them is the point that, again, Professor Calabrese made, that uh, pharmaceutical companies are looking for blockbusters. They basically want to roll out the cannons um, and get a gigantic effect, whereas most of what is being talked about here today is in the 30 to 60 percent range. But I think I'm going to point out for you, I hope I point out for you, that there are some examples where 30 to 60 percent is exactly the right, uh, the right change that we really should be looking at. Uh, and then finally, I'll end with some examples of uh, areas where we should perhaps be putting our money, putting our effort to uh, advance this, this field in its clinical application. Um, so uh, this is uh, my, my, uh, my bit of attempt at humor here. Uh, I didn't actually uh, make the drawing, of course, but uh, it's a way for me to sort of relax my own and produce a, a hormetic response. I feel a little better after I read this joke. So it says up there, how do you know this is wrong? And he has added 11 and 12 and come to uh, 1,112. And he says, maybe it's just unorthodox. So anti-cancer agents um, in fact, can uh, anti-cancer agents, and I, they use the term uh, properly, these are agents that have been shown to be anti-cancer in high doses, but in fact, in low doses, they can enhance tumor growth. The uh, tamoxifen is a particularly interesting and disturbing example. Tamoxi tamoxifen is given to uh, women who have um, either have breast cancer or have uh, uh, survived uh, a breast cancer uh, chemotherapy or surgery. And in fact, it, at the doses that they take, um, and they take tamoxifen on a, a weekly uh, or biweekly basis, depending on, on uh, who's prescribing it and what's being prescribed for. At the, at the dose that they take, they are anti-cancer. Uh, anti uh, however, as time progresses and uh, the days go by before their next dose, the concentration of tamoxifen in their bloodstream decreases. Now, this has not been shown in any good clinical studies, but you can demonstrate in tissue culture that the concentrations that are found in C2, in the blood of women who are taking tamoxifen, the concentrations that are found at the end of their dose is just the right dose to produce and in, 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 uh, uh, encourage uh, their, the tumor growth that they're trying to inhibit. 
And uh, it's, it's this observation that really needs to be uh, uh, pursued with more vigor because it could be that you need to be very careful about the dosing that's done with tamoxifen and be very and look for this low dose response and it is not typically done looking at the, at the hormetic range is only now starting to reach the pharmaceutical literature and and it's just barely coming into that area so why, do, why, why is this now? Why, is it, why are we in 2012 and just having this discussion? Why, why haven't we had these, these lectures 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, 40 years ago in the 60s, and in fact, when this whole area and this whole concept was developed at the beginning of the 20th century? Why, why are we 100 years later before we're even having serious discussions about it? One of them is that it was developed within the field of to toxicology. And that, that uh, there's often very little crosstalk between disciplines. So uh, toxicologists are only talking to biologists about poisons and environmental damage. And biologists are only paying attention to toxicologists when, they, when that's the discussion. And it, this is uh, observed. And we all know this intellectually, but still the difficulty in having crosstalks between disciplines, the terminology that's used in each discipline do not, does not lend itself to having those kind of discussions. And so that, that was one thing that has delayed the discussions we're having today. The other one was, in the early days, um, it was thought to be strictly stimulatory. Uh, that is, the hormetic response was, was thought to be strictly stimulatory. And so there was um, a, 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 a feeling that, that this was um, a biased observation. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. And again, uh, uh, Dr. Oberbaum came up. Are you still here, uh, Menachem? Uh, but at any rate, uh, Dr. Oberbaum came up at the beginning of this, this lecture today, and he said, uh, I'm one of the people that thinks there is no association between hormesis and homeopathy, and I don't want to, I'd, I'd be happy to debate him about that, but I'm actually not sure that, that the, he isn't correct. In fact, historically, though, Hormesis, when it was first developed as a concept at the early part of the 20th century, was grabbed and picked up immediately by homeopaths as the explanation for uh, homeopathy. The mechanism had finally been discovered. And because, as I, I suspect you all appreciate, homeopathy um, has often been a marginalized and uh, and uh, thought of as quackery in, in some fields, that reflected on hormesis and caused the people who were interested in hormesis to ignore clinical research, to stay within toxicology because it felt dangerous to them to even get involved in this debate in the medical world. And so it, again, it inhibited the translation of this knowledge into practice. And as I mentioned before, and has been brought up earlier today, high-dose pharmacology works wonderfully well. Nobody's going to dispute the power of an antibiotic. Uh, nobody's going to dispute uh, the power of chemotherapeutic agents. Um, there is, of course, as we are now aware, a problem associated with, with high-dose pharmacology, and that is that you can, in fact, um, generate what are now being called superbugs. Um, basically, it's a gigantic evolutionary experiment where we, we kill off 95, 98 percent of the bacteria in our bodies, and our bodies then can take care of the next 2 percent. But in the environment, if you're doing that in a hospital environment, if you, you have 2 percent of the bacteria left in the room, in an operating room, they very happily multiply and what you have left, what you started with, were the 2% that were resistant to the pharmaceutical agent, and this produces what we now have, a number of very dangerous, very deadly uh, bacteria that we really don't have the tools to deal with. Um, so, but the, when the introduction of high-dose pharmacology in the... Um, in the mid-20th century, early 20th century, there was not much interest in looking at something that produced only a 30 or 60 percent range uh, change when, in fact, you could uh, pr provide a drug and get a thousand-fold, a million-fold decrease in uh, or, or uh, effect from the agent. Um, and then, importantly, um, there was a disastrous first attempt to bring hormesis into clinical practice. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. Um, and and uh, a, a person of note, that is, he was very wealthy, died. Um, and I'll come back to that. I think it's in my next slide, so don't let me steal my own thunder. Um, so 
It's termed in, uh, the term arose, hormesis, the term arose in 1943. Uh, two toxicologists uh, developed this as a concept. And uh, until recently, essentially because of Professor Calabrese's work, it was considered uh, a fringe idea. It was not a major idea in toxicology. Professor Calabrese and his colleagues have, have brought this much more up into the public eye. And um, he talked quite a bit about the threshold uh, model. And there are now textbooks out there, toxicological textbooks out there, that do in fact make reference to he uh, hormesis and point out that the uh, threshold model may not be applicable in many situations. But, um, but in the beginning, it was, it was on, the, on the fringe. Um, it's still, hormesis and, and this work is still principally in the environmental risk assessment areas. Um, in in uh, some of my work, which I'll show you a little later, and in some other folks, uh, it's becoming more and more into the biomedical world. And you'll hear more about that today, I'm sure. Um, you can now find it in pharmacology texts. Uh, in the last uh, five, ten years, there have been a few texts published in which there is reference to this. Um, and, but nonetheless, most pharmacologists that we speak to on a one-to-one -one basis are unaware of this term and under, unaware of its ubiquitousness, its general applicability, and its potential. Um, you have to usually introduce the conversation with something like adaptive response things that they learned in uh, introductory biology. Initially defined as a stimulatory effects uh, of low doses of toxins. The emphasis on this apparent positive effect with, with, uh, while ignoring the, the negative impact, that is the inhibition that you can see in hormesis, uh, produced this, this bias that um, uh, that skeptics viewed, uh, uh, considered, um, was an indication of a bias, and so it was again ignored as a, an important, uh, an important aspect of biology. Calabrese and Baldwin um, showed wide, showed how widespread this phenomenon. Uh, he mentioned the thousands of references that he has collected. Um, and uh, it, it basically, if you look at almost any published work in tissue culture, and if they have done a low dose study, if they have taken the agent down to a low enough dose, it shows up virtually every time. I don't think there's an exception, uh, but perhaps uh, Professor Calabrese can think of one. But as far as I know, if it's taken down to the, uh, to the threshold and past the threshold, every study that's reported actually shows it in their data. They often ignore those points, view them as spurious, irrelevant, not the point, but it's, it's standing right there in their graphs. Um, there has, in, in, uh, on the positive side of this, been the recent formation of the International Hormesis Society. Even so, few physicians and clinical investigators are involved. So let's talk about its association with uh, homeopathy. And again, I'm sorry that uh, Oberbaum is not here, but uh, perhaps we'll have other people in the audience who will, will debate us on this. So in contrast to toxicologists, homeopaths quickly adopted this idea. Schultz, in particular, claimed and, and uh, trumpeted this as the mechanism. Finally, the mechanism for homeopathy has been discovered. This, again, made the skeptics even more wary. Rather than clearly distinguishing hormesis from homeop homeopathy, then the people who were interested in hormesis basically said, we will stay away from the clinical world. This is too complicated. It's too controversial. This is an, a place we do not want to, uh, to tread. And, um, but this is very unfortunate, especially given that today CAM, complementary and alternative medicine, is becoming extremely popular. And in the United States alone, um, most people, the vast majority of people, claim to be using some form of CAM. A recent NIH uh, study has uh, shown this. Um, and we are now more, more and more interested in what happens at the low dose. Again, because of the, the, um, the observation and the fear of uh, producing superbugs. What happens if we use a lower dose? Can we get away with a lower dose? Do we have to, in fact, take 10 days of antibiotics, or could we, in fact, take three days of antibiotics? Um, can we get an effect that is uh, salutogenic, that is, uh, induces internal healing processes with something as simple as herbs and, and vitamins? Um, 
and homeopathic substances. So, as I mentioned before, the power of pharmacology, antibiotics, anesthetics, analgesics, chemotherapy, therapeutic agents, these are very effective. There's no dispute about that. Nobody wants to see them go away. Perhaps we should consider being using, using them um, with more care and less often. The focus now is on lower toxicity. How do you get a, a uh, chemotherapeutic uh, therapeutic agent that doesn't cause you to vomit, doesn't cause you to lose all your hair? Could you, in fact, take something with a lower dose and produce lower toxicity? So Eben Byers was a, a millionaire, uh, turn of the century again, in the 30s, 40s, and um, he became a proponent of hormesis and particularly became convinced that radioactivity produced uh, increased lifespan. And by the way, there is some evidence that small doses of radiation, like what one gets in a, a chest x-ray, done infrequently, may increase your, uh, your lifespan by a couple years. Um, looks like a hormetic effect. It, a little controversial, but nonetheless, he believed that it was a longevity tonic and did a lot of radiation, and he died in 1932. That pretty much closed the discussion on clinical hormesis. It was a very dramatic, he was a, a dramatic person, he was a high-profile person, and he died a fairly horrible death from using the radiation. We would, uh, I think we could claim today that it, he actually wasn't doing a hormetic dose, but that's, again, another story. So in, I've referenced a few of the uh, more recent work, uh, 2005, 2002, 2003, um, in which you can show uh, basically clinical effects, clinical hormesis, Alzheimer's, bone marrow re, uh, uh, bone remineraliza remineralization, tumor growth and revascularization, uh, hair growth, bacterial infection, lupus, Graves' disease. The list, in fact, is a considerably longer but all of these conditions um, in, in uh, clinical treatment with standard agents at low doses show hormetic effects, beneficial effects in almost every case. Low doses of toxic and infectious agents stimulate growth, repair, and protective processes. This is, if you will, um, my working definition for hormesis. It is ubiquitous. There, it's, there, as I say, no system that's been looked at has, shown, has not shown this, um, this, this, this behavior. And I, I dare say that it's probably a property of complex systems themselves, biological systems being a penultimate example of complexity. You have a complex enough system, you gently perturb it, something where you don't produce a, a adverse, a destructive uh, phenomenon, it will respond in a positive way to that. It will respond in a way to bring itself back to homeostasis. And that's, at some level, at a meta level, that's what I believe is going on here, that small perturbations to very complex systems produce this result. And in fact, you may see things like hormesis in, econo in economic systems and political systems when they become big enough and complex enough. So uh, one of the more interesting ones that has always struck me as fascinating, um, and I'll tell you a little story around this, is dioxin. Uh, dioxin is a, a known uh, carcinogen at high doses, and dioxin uh, was produced by an American uh, chemical company, and uh, the waste, they, they essentially polluted the Hudson River, large river in, uh, in New York. Um, and the EPA, having zero tolerance, the Environmental Protection Agency of the of, uh, United States, having zero tolerance for cancer agents, has insisted that this company bring the dioxin levels in the Hudson River to zero. That is technically an impossibility. They have spent billions of dollars to try to do that under court order and have lowered the amount of dioxin in the water significantly. Interestingly, at very low doses, essentially the doses that are in the Hudson River today, it is an anti-cancer agent, shown in animal models and tissue culture models. I had a discussion with a lawyer who presented this uh, all the way up to the state Supreme Court, the um, 
second highest court in the, in the land in, in the U.S., of New York. And the judges uh, listened to the argument, listened pro and con, um, actually went and read Calabrese's papers and came back and he said, I am absolutely convinced that this, uh, that this is a real phenomenon and in fact there is some benefit perhaps of having small levels of dioxin in our water. And he said, and I am never going to make it legal and it is never going to be legal until somebody in Congress passes a law that says it's okay to take an anti-cancer agent, I'm sorry, a carcinogen at low levels. So far that hasn't happened and I think it's going to be a long time before that does happen. And it has to do with the labeling. Dioxin is known to be a uh, carcinogen. But nonetheless, there are uh, people who make laws who really are convinced that this phenomenon is real and that there is some benefit from it. That because of the way we have structured our whole biomedical system and our whole environmental toxic, uh, toxicological system, it's very hard to apply this to reality. Um, Another example is uh, CBRN, uh, Chemical Biological Radiation Nuclear Terrorism. Um, there is excellent evidence, and within my institute, the Samueli Institute, we are in discussions with the American De uh, Department of Defense to actually use hormetic approaches as anti-terroristic agents for these kinds of attacks. Now, uh, as Professor Calabrese pointed out and is well known, 30 to 60 percent, you get a 30 to 60 percent protection, uh, 30 to 60 percent change in the biology. And in fact, um, we are not claiming, nobody is claiming that this would um, stop everybody in, uh, from, from getting radiation poisoning from a dirty bomb in a city, but in fact getting a 30 percent improvement in survival would be a significant um, effect, and the uh, Department of Defense is paying serious attention to this. They don't have to worry about Congress passing a law. Um, it is specific and general. It is a general phenomenon for sure. We have been able to show some fairly high specificity in its response. That is, we can, we can produce protection against an insult from a specific agent by giving small doses of that specific agent first. And it seems to be fairly specific. I do not understand, given my own thinking about how that works, I do not understand why that happens. But again, I suspect it's because the complexity of the system allows for specificity itself. Um, and then they are, uh, as we've mentioned a couple of times, um, below the, um, the no adverse effect level and um, and, and, and so there's, there's a sort of a, well, what harm can be done uh, aspect of this as well. Um, so can we, in fact, mitigate toxic and infectious agents with hormetic approaches? And is there a wider application for this? And is it safer? So we came up with a term at the Institute, uh, rapid induction of protective tolerance, uh, because this phenomenon is fairly rapid um, and it produces a protected, protection against the next insult. So um, and well, I'll, I'll show you some specific examples. I won't steal my own thunder. Um, so exposure to a subtoxic dose of a lower toxic agent confers protection against later insult. It induces a stimulatory cell repair this has been shown, by the way, this is not theoretical. You can find cell repair mechanisms are turned on. Um, the tolerance um, and uh, protective processes, a number of biochemical processes are turned on and they can be specific to the organ, to the tissue, to the cell. It is a coordinated whole organism response and I will come back to this in a little bit about that nature. Um, it is, um, it is therefore complex and difficult to investigate because it is a whole organism response. Every, bit, every tissue, every organ, every cell that is sensitive to this agent, if you expose them to it, if you ingest this agent, if you inhale this agent at a low enough dose, the entire organism responds. Um, Although I, I've, I've disagreed with, with uh, Professor Calabrese on, on this one uh, a couple of times, you can think a little bit about hormesis, you can think about it uh, as um, uh, illustrative, is, uh, is weightlifting. Um, if you lift weights you, uh, and you, you do it in a, a, a low dose, relatively speaking, you actually get stronger. 
If you lift too much, you can actually do significant damage. And that's a way to talk about hormesis, is a way to think about it. I'm not absolutely convinced that's a hormetic response, by the way, but it's a nice, simple illustration of the concept itself. Um, so in clinical application, you get redundancy, you get uh, multiple systems are kicked on, and this is why this is probably such an effective, should be such an effective clinical intervention. Even though you're only looking at 30 to 60 percent change, if you are, um, uh, have, a, have a cancer, if you're decreasing it by 30 to 60 percent with a hormetic approach, think how much less toxic agent you need to take to deal with the tumor cells that are left. It is distinct from immune system. The immune system we, we feel we know quite a bit about as biologists. And hormesis is not the same thing as the immune stimulation. But I am absolutely convinced that they work synergistically and do can work synergistically. And so, uh, again, back to chemotherapeutic agents, this would be an excellent way to, um, to, to apply this thing. So, um, you can show in, um, in all of these systems here, in all of these occurrences, um, uh, hormesis. Uh, Pre-exposure to uh, low levels of heat induce heat shot protein, and then the next time you uh, expose the organism or the cells or the tissues to heat, they will tolerate significantly more heat because the hormetic system has been turned on, the cells have set up their protective processes, they've got cell repair mechanisms already kicked into place, and so the next time you insult it with the same agent, they're prepared to deal with it, and they can tolerate more of that agent. Nicotine, low levels of, uh, of, of nicotine. My colleagues over here were, were saying, wouldn't that be wonderful if only two or three cigarettes a day were really good for you? Well, in fact, the evidence is that that's true. Um, a couple of cigarettes a day appears to be an anti-Alzheimer drug. The problem, of course, with nicotine is it's the most potent um, addictive drug on the planet, with maybe one or two exceptions, and it's very hard to do just one or two cigarettes a day. Um, alcohol, same thing. A little bit of alcohol appears to be very good for you. We've all seen the literature, I'm sure, where for men, uh, two ounces of alcohol a day is um, apparently excellent for your health. In the case of women, it's one drink a day. Uh, again, the problem, though, is that alcohol um, is very hard to prevent having three drinks or four drinks. But if you actually keep yourself to two drinks, the evidence is, is overwhelming that it is, it is actually good for you. Um, heavy metals, the same way, cadmium, lead, uh, carcinogenic agents, uh, interleukin-1, uh, gram-negative organisms and other stressors. Again, the list is, is significantly long on where low-level exposures to gram-negative organisms or other kinds of stressors, psychological stressors, will produce, if you will, a resistive state that secondary infections then are resisted. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, a model that I did in my lab, and I meant it to be a homeopathic experiment, which is one of the reasons I brought it up. It turns out that I, I no longer believe that's what it was. I think it's actually a demonstration of hormesis and has nothing to do with homeopathy in this particular case. And so I need to give you a little bit of background so we're all on the same page. This is a mid-cerebral arterial occlusion. It's a rat model. Um, you do some preliminary surgery so that you can stick and let me see if I can learn how to use this, yes. So that you can put a filament into um, this artery and run it up to this part and it's right outside of the brain. And this represents a stroke. It behaves, it's an excellent model of stroke because it's a little sloppy. A little bit of blood leaks by, but you've blocked off most of the blood. And um, you, you leave the filament in there for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, more than an hour, and you've killed the animal. And then you withdraw the, the filament, and you get a reperfusion, rapid reperfusion of blood and oxygen, and you get what's called an ischemic event, and, or, or commonly known as a stroke. And this is what it looks like if you section the brains of these animals. Um, and this is, uh, for those of you who are neuro neuroanatomists, the bregma is a, a point in the brain with, that we reference everything else to. And these are relatively thin sections and then have been stained with a stain that's specific for mitochondria. Healthy mitochondria will s absorb this and turn red. When the mitochondria are dead, therefore the cell is dead, um, 
And for those of you who are not pure biologists, mitochondria is where we get energy from. They produce ATP. So uh, you see white. And you can see that um, six hours after the filament has been, in this case, has been in, in place for an hour, and then removed. Six hours after that event, um, the damage is, is starting to become significant. In 24 hours, you lose a large chunk of the brain. Um, and then at 72 hours, virtually half the brain is taken out. This is um, just a brief basic biological introduction. During an ischemic event, um, these, these channels in particular are activated by glutamate. Glutamate floods the brain. We don't really understand why this is. It's a bit like the uh, Harikari uh, suicide. It's, it's, it's a bizarre sort of sequence of events. We don't understand why biology is set up this way, but it is when you starve it for oxygen and suddenly then reperfuse with oxygen, cells tend to commit suicide. They get overexcited, perhaps. And they, they overstimulate themselves with glutamate, which produces this cascade of events. The cells depolarize, and poof, the cells die. And if enough of them die, you have a stroke. Oops, did I skip something? It looks like I skipped something. How do I go the other way? There we go. OK. Whoops. OK. So. Um, this is ultra-low dose glutamate. It's, in fact, uh, I made the glutamate uh, myself homeopathically. That is, I put it in water at one molar and I succussed it uh, until I was down to what's called 30C, which amounts to 10 to the minus 60th molar by calculating. And those of you who know Avogadro's number, well, I am at least um, 20 orders of magnitude less than Avogadro's number, so the probability of having even one glut glutamate um, molecule in there approaches zero, if not absolutely zero. And what I did is I gave this to these animals after the stroke, which again, the, the physicians in the room will appreciate the significance of that. So the ischemic event has occurred, and I give it to the animals uh, I've been, I inject it um, in an in a, in a, uh, inline that we put in before the, uh, before the experiment began, and I inject r relatively large quantities um, of, this, of this preparation. And in the control animals, I inject water. So uh, my experimental one is a homeopathic preparation in water, and the, uh, the control is just the water. And if you, in the water, uh, oh, and by the way, the, this, is, this is just the animal that was in the middle of all my other animals. You get always variation in all, in all animal models. There's a lot of noise in them. So there were some animals that had virtually no evidence of ischemia, and some animals that, were, that looked like um, they, they'd had significant damage, even though I had, had done this intervention. So I didn't look for the slide. I simply took the numerical middle, the norm, and this is the kind of damage you see. About half of, the, um, of this part of the brain is obliterated. That is, the cells are dead. This is where the glutamate, this is an animal, again, just the statistical uh, median. Um, and you'll notice that there is, uh, well, you, perhaps you can't do the calculation, but I use a computer that actually measures this area. This is over a 50% reduction in the ischemic size. This is phenomenal. If this actually works, in clinical setting, this is a major breakthrough because the problem with a stroke is that you only, the clinician only sees the stroke victim after the stroke, and all the damage is thought to have been done. Somehow, this actually is able to stop the damage or reverse it, and I find that a little hard to believe, but nonetheless, this is a dramatic result. I'm actually convinced that it's, actually, that it's not a homeopathic event because we started looking at what was in this, this solution. And as I told you, there's no glutamate. But what there was there is silica and boron and sodium. And for the chemists in the room, you'll appreciate borosilicate glass is just that. It is glass. And that's how I made the solution. And we did some very sophisticated chemical analysis and showed that in this solution, the only thing I could measure and the only thing that should be there is glass. And I don't have these pictures with me today, but we actually went back and did this experiment, and we applied, we just injected dissolved glass into the animals instead of a homeopathic solution, and we got the same results. It's essentially a low-dose application of silica to the brains of ischemic animals, and it produces protection. 
And we also did uh, proteomics and genomics, and we show cellular repair mechanisms are turned on by the application of silica. I don't know why the silica does it, but I'm convinced this is a hormetic event itself. And once we can get this published, I've tried to, I've submitted this, by the way, to three, at this point, six journals. They all have rejected it because they bring a, 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 what I believe is a dogmatic, a dogmatic approach to this, which is this simply can't be so. And this is, I, I did this on 130 animals. And first of all, my karma is probably very bad, having uh, damaged 130 animals. But for those of you who've done any animal research, that's about 10 times more than you have to actually do. And the significance is P point, uh, the P is 0 .0005. Um, but it's still not being accepted in the literature. So wish me luck. Another study we did, which did get published, by the way, because it's a little less controversial, is using cadmium. Um, we used uh, low doses of cadmium, that is below the NOEL, below the toxic level, and we exposed us uh, prostate cells in a tissue culture model, human prostate cells, and we were able to show through uh, genomics and some other sophisticated methods that both uh, the MRA is turned on for a particular metallothionine. And metallothionines, there are about 40 of them in us, um, and these were human prostates, so there are about 40 metallothionines. And their job is to chelate and to manage um, heavy, metal, heavy metals that, are, that we're, we're exposed to all the time. They also do some, maybe do some other things we don't know anything about, but we do know that they're involved in this heavy, heavy metal protection. But we're giving them a low-dose cadmium, non-toxic. We saw no adverse effect on cell growth, replication, function, or mortality. The cells seem to be perfectly normal from our point of view. But we then exposed them to a high enough dose of cadmium to be, to have, um, uh, to be known to be carcinogenic. It induces a transformation of the cells to, uh, the prostate cells, to cancer cells, to, to cancerous prostate. And, um, and we, of course, we did the control arm, and in our hands it behaved the same way. The high doses do this. But in fact, what happened is that it delayed the transformation. It didn't prevent the transformation, but it delayed it, delayed it for um, weeks before it onset. And interestingly enough, this uh, non-toxic exposure lasted. Whatever mechanisms were turned on, whatever the hormetic mechanisms were turned on, and we believe they were metallothionines, um, that protection lasts for weeks. The application might be that low-dose cadmium is um, an anti-prostate cancer uh, dietary supplement. And for those of you who may be in prostate cancer research, not based upon our work, but based upon some other epidemiological work, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health in, in, um, in America, uh, provided a large multi-center grant to, act, to explore this idea that low-dose cadmium in men's diets would um, would provide a protection against prostate cancer. About uh, nine months, 12 months into this study, uh, it was discovered that in some of the patients, they were getting a higher incidence of prostate cancer. So the study was stopped. Later analysis in, has, has indicated to us that it was a hormetic response. Cadmium comes from our environment. It's in our food unless you live in certain parts of the world where there is very little, very little cadmium in your environment. It also comes from Brazil nuts. I don't know what the Italian word is for Brazil nuts, so hopefully the translator knows it. But Brazil nuts, which are these large nuts that come from Brazil, are very high in cadmium. The people that were dying lived in environments where their diet already had a high level of cadmium in them. And the therapy that was being applied pushed them into the high-dose range of cadmium and induced the prostate cancer. For the men who were in relatively low cadmium environments, the cadmium diet was producing protection from prostate cancer. Unfortunately, because of the way the rules work at NIH, if your people start to die in your study, they close it down and they're not likely to reopen it. So we've been able to, un unable to reopen that study. But I, I would like to encourage all the men in the room to take a look at their environment and see how much cadmium is in their environment, maybe eat some Brazil nuts. Um, so I think that's this entire slide. Um, so um, in 2004, in the New England Journal of Medicine, premier journal, um, there was reported a study in which 
low-dose um, uh, low influenza vaccines actually produced a, um, an equal and perhaps better um, uh, anti-influenza uh, uh, effect. Um, so this phenomenon uh, it, it's not been applied, by the way, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in reality. But again, it could be that lower doses of influenza vaccine is actually the way to go. And the evidence supports this very strongly. Um, the problem, of course, like it is with, with many new areas, is that we don't really have a good mechanistic understanding of what's going on. Um, it is difficult to optimize low-dose effects. Your, your range at which you see this phenomenon is fairly narrow, and the studies necessary to do this, we're, we're now getting into uh, pharmaceutical company level uh, of investments that require this to really optimize this dose. And as I just pointed out in the um, cadmium and prostate story, uh, it can be a very tricky uh, place to be. And um, then, then the, uh, again, uh, the, something we've talked about a couple of times today, in many, many studies, there is a failure to take it past the threshold because everybody knows, and you'll notice my air quotes, everybody knows that, um, uh, that the threshold level, after the threshold level, nothing important happens. That's simply not true. And as I say, bizarrely enough, people who have studies in which they've looked past the, uh, the threshold level, the observations are just thrown away as being unimportant, or if they're mentioned at all. So where do, where do I think there should be uh, research uh, areas to, to pursue? Where do, I, where do I think the sweet spots are here? in toxins. Examination of the protective effects and cellular mechanism of low doses and cellular toxins and several types of stressors would be a great place to start looking for beneficial effects. Uh, some examples, botulinum, cyanide, cadmium, congee, ricin. Ricin, one of the most deadly substances on the planet. Small amounts of ricin are actually appear to be protective against further insult. Um, viruses. The, uh, the influenza study that I just showed you um, indicates that um, uh, looking at antiviral uh, remedies and looking at the low-dose uh, end of antiviral um, work would be a great place to, uh, to probably find some, uh, some uh, fruit, fruitful ground. Food and diet. Um, the salutogenic, I don't know if you know the word, salutogenesis is this idea that we have intrinsic healing processes and you can induce them with things like low-calorie diets. There's great evidence that low-calorie diets uh, extend life in primates, uh, excuse me, in uh, rodents. Unfortunately, there's uh, two recent studies, one from University of Wisconsin, one from the NIH, that indicate that does not work in primates. So it looks like it won't affect our mortality, but I can tell you from reading those papers that it does decrease, uh, low, low, um, low calorie diets do seem to decrease in these primates, uh, the incidence of tumors um, and a diabetes like a phenomenon, which of course makes perfect sense. So low dose diets, low calorie diets, essentially a hormetic phenomenon. Um, and of course, exercise. I mentioned um, the fact that um, I, I, I think uh, weightlifting may not be true hormesis. It may be closer to uh, adaptive response and the relationship between hormesis and adaptive response we can talk about uh, perhaps later today. But exercise, clearly um, there you can exercise too much, cause damage. The right amount of exercise um, is, is very good for us. Uh, and perhaps you all will ask uh, Professor Calabrese about his experience uh, as, a, as a bike rider. He's a serious rider, rides uh, 100, 100 kilometers a day? How much? Time? Almost, yeah. So, um, and he's, he's in excellent shape. Um, and, I, and then herbs, and of course, homeopathy itself. In spite of the fact that there has been a division between hormesis and hormetic researchers in homeopathy, that may be premature. And uh, Professor Oberbaum's um, uh, introductory talk notwithstanding, I think that we shouldn't close that door too fast. And then stress management. A little bit of stress is good for us. A lot of stress is bad for us. But we appear to be responsive to a little bit of stress. You know, it's good for us. You don't want to have a completely easy life. You want to you want to deal with some troubles. It seems to be good for us, and I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you.